Okay, so this is from Akute Sicha. This is the name of the series, volume 23, Masay, the second parasha, Sicha 1. Okay, always traveling. You got the answer right there. The answer is going to be that we never really camp. Even when we camp, we're still traveling. That's the answer. We can go home now. No, I'm kidding. Let's read it inside. Okay. Regarding the verse, and this is the opening verse of the second parasha that we read this parasha this week, but it's the opening verse of the portion of Masay, which is the final portion of the book of Numbers. So regarding the verse, these are the journeys, Masae, of the children of Israel, which then introduces all the places to where they journeyed, a question is raised. Since scripture recounts the places where the Jewish people camped throughout their lengthy journey, the intent is not to recount the sections of journey between the encampments, but to focus on the places where they stopped from traveling, right? If, if you want to discuss the traveling, so then you say, well, we traveled on Route 80, and then on Route 684, and then on Route 287, Talk about the journey, but we're not mentioning the journey. We don't know anything about the journey. What do we know about? What are the, what are the places that we list? We list the places where they camped. So if they list the place to where they camped, that's what we should refer to. So that's what, he, that's what he, we're asking. If so, it should not have said these are the journeys, which is Masse of the children of Israel, but, um, but these are the encampments, Chanayot of the children of Israel. These are the places where the Jews stopped and rested. That's the question. Furthermore, during the 40 years that the, Jew, that the Jews were in the desert, most of the time and the most significant periods, the Jews were not traveling from place to place, but resting in their encampments. Therefore, when, chronicle, when chronicling the Jewish peoples stay in the desert, scripture should have emphasized the encampments. This is a very interesting point. We say the Jews wandered in the desert for 40 years. They weren't doing that much wandering. Because if you think about it, they took 42 journeys in 40, in 40 years, but many of the journeys were in year one. Many of the journeys were in year 40, okay? So that leaves you something like 20 journeys in, four, in 38 years. Of those 20 journeys, they were in one place for 18 years, right? So it's not like they were constantly on the go. I mean, it's still a lot of moving. I, I don't know. I didn't move that many of houses or apartments but the last time I moved, I said, please, God, I don't want to do this again. <laughs> it's too much schlepping. But again, the point is that most of the time they were not journeying. Most of the time they were in camping. They were in, in, in camp. They were camped. So if we want to talk about the chronicles of the Jewish people in the desert, say encampments. That's, 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 um, that's, that's the question. Now, what we're going to start is to say is we're going to say, well, Rashi may have addressed this at the end of book number two. Book number two, Exodus. Exodus concludes, says, basically describes the end of the book of Exodus, describes how the Jewish people built the tabernacle, built the Mishkan. And it describes how on top of the Mishkan, there was the, there was the, there was the uh, cloud that rested on the Mishkan. And when the rich cloud um, went up, and it was raised. The Jewish people knew it's time to travel. And when the cloud rested, they knew it was time to encamp. And then it concludes, this, this happened in all their journeys. So Rashi there said, let's see what Rashi says. Seemingly, this can be resolved by previous comment of Rashi. At the end of Parashas Pikude, last parasha of the book of, um, the second book of Exodus, on the clause throughout their journeys, that's the final words of the book, Rashi comments, the places where they camp is also called journey. Likewise, these are the journeys. Since they resume their journeys from where they camped, they are all called, they are all called journeys. This means that the term journeys, Masse, includes both phases, they journeyed and they camped. So that's Rashi's answer over there. Rashi's answer over there seems very straightforward. Yes, a journey has two parts. The journey has the part where you travel and the journey has the part where you rest. But Rashi says both the journey and the rest are called journeys. Why? Because after you finish resting, you're going to continue traveling. So because you're going to continue traveling, we can call the entire thing journeys. That's what that's that's Rashi's interpretation over there. Let's finish this section and we'll summarize. Um, however, this explanation itself requires clarification. If the place where they camped is called a journey, since they resumed their journeys from where they camped, it should be reversed. The camp is the conclusion and completion of the prior phase they journeyed. They journeyed should be included in they camped and not the reverse. Additionally, even if journeying includes the encampments between journeys, it doesn't fit in smoothly in our context. Given that the primary emphasis lies in the encampments, as mentioned earlier, the term journey should not have been employed 
as it implies that the focus was that they journeyed, it's just that the place where they encamped can also be called journeying. So that's the first question. So just to summarize very quickly what we're talking about over here, the opening statement of the last parsha of the book of last section of the book of Numbers, which is what we're going to read this week, is these are the journeys of the Jewish people in the desert in the last 40 years. And that the word Masay journeys is in fact the word that becomes the name of the parsha. So our question is, the Rebbe's question is, why are you referring to this as journeys if the Torah is not listing, um, if the Torah is not listing the actual journeys that they traveled? It doesn't tell you the highways they took in the desert. Instead, what it says is the places where they camped. So the question becomes, instead of saying these are the journeys of the Jewish people, it should have said these are the encampments. We tried to answer with Rashi, but we're not satisfied with that answer. Okay, now we're going to move on a little bit, and we're going to go, we're going to skip a paragraph, a chapter, uh, a section. We're going to go to section three, and we're going to talk about the beautiful teaching of the Baal Shem Tov. The, the Baal Shem Tov says like this, the founder of the Hasidic movement teaches us that when you study the Torah, the Torah is not just a history book. The Torah is not just recounting what happened to the Jewish people in the desert, but the Torah has to be relevant to everybody's life. And therefore, says the Baal Shem Tov, that just like the Jewish people in the desert traveled 42 journeys and they stopped in 42 places and each place has a name because it refers to an event that happened in that place. Um, every person throughout their life is also going to process and go through these 42 journeys in their own personal life. Um, and he lists some of those places. We'll get into that in a minute. The key, the very interesting point here is, is that um, a very interesting point here is that in the simple reading, some of those places have names that refer to sin. For example, there's a place that the Jewish people uh, desired meat and they complained that they want meat and God gave them meat. And then there was a plague and people died and they buried the people who had cravings. So it's called Kivrota Ta'ava, the burial of the cravings. So seemingly, this is a negative, a neg a ne a negative journey. So if the Baal Shem Tov said that everybody has 42 journeys in their life, does that mean that everybody is predetermined that everybody is going to have a place where they're going to have negative cravings? Says the Baal Shem Tov, no. You could interpret that story as a positive because if you read the verse literally, if you read the word literally, kivrota ta'ava, literally is the burial of temptation. Not the burial of those who were tempted or those who craved, but the burial of temptation. In other words, you can read the story. This story can play out. We know every person is going to reach this level in their life where they have temptation. Now the question becomes, does the temptation bury you or do you bury the temptation? How do you bury the temptation? So the Baal Shem Tov says, you reached a level of chachma, of enlightenment, and now you're not tempted anymore. So in other words, we, all, we are, we are all gonna, gonna reach one of these 42 journeys, all these 42 journeys in our life. How it's gonna play out, that's already in our hands. But the point here, so that's so that we're introducing that teaching. How does that help our question? Our question is, it makes our question even stronger. So if the 42 steps are actually not just technically places where the Jewish people rested, but it's 42 steps in the ladder of becoming closer to God, then why don't you mention them? That, that's the key. The key is the level you reached. When, you, when you're on rung 36, you reach rung 36, you have 36 levels of serving God. Seemingly, that should be celebrated. So focus on the levels you reach. Focus on the chanayot, on the encampments, on the place where I reach this level. Why are you focusing on the journey? The journey tells you nothing about where you are. It's just a journey. It doesn't tell us even how they traveled. So we're going to bring in the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov to strengthen our question. So that's where we're at right now. I'm going to read share the screen. I'm going to read a little bit. Um, hopefully it'll be clear with the introduction that I gave, but if it's not, please don't wait for the end. Please jump in. Let's make this exciting. Okay, so we're going to read. We're going to read number. We're going to read number three, which is what we just said. Then we're going to give the answer in number four, and then if we have time, we'll elaborate on the answer, or we'll go to the end, which is a, 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 a pretty a pretty radical idea. We'll get to that in, in due course. Okay, let's read number three. Number three, a familiar teaching of the Baal Shem Tov, based on the verse, "These are the journeys of the children of Israel." Opening opening statement of the parsha says the Baal Shem Tov is that forty two journeys correspond to the stages in the life of every Jew. The first journey who left the land of Egypt alludes to a person's birth, right? You're coming out of the straits. You're coming out of the womb. You're coming out of the straits. That is the, that's the birth. 
Um, then throughout his life, he experiences the other journeys until he reaches the supreme life in the supernal land, right? The journeys end when the Jewish people are at the bank of the Jordan River about to enter the land of Israel. Metaphorically, um, uh, paradise is referred to in the in scripture as Artsot HaChaim, the life of the living, eternal life, this eternal supernal land where you get eternal life. So the Baal Shem Tov says, everybody goes from Egypt to Israel. Everyone goes from birth to the end of life where they on the prefaces of entering the afterlife. And everybody's going to go through that, 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 those 42 journeys. The Baal Shem Tov explains, for example, that's the place I mentioned, that Kivro Tatava, literally the graves of the craving, is associated with the aspect of Chachma. In other words, it doesn't mean that every person is going to experience craving and the craving is going to bury them. No. When the Torah says you're going to reach a place of, 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 of Kivro Tatava, literally the burial of the cravings, it means a person that, that represents the, the idea that a person could reach a state of enlightenment, of Chachma, of wisdom, of enlightenment. Because over there, they bury the, those who, with cravings. That's what the verse says. The verse says it's called Kivro Tatava, the burial of the cravings, because there they bury the people who craved. Our interpretation, our interpretation is going to be, the mystical interpretation is as follows, meaning physical desires cease to exist for those who attain the attribute of Chachma out of their intense embrace of Hashem. It is explained that all the journeys were holy and pure. And even those during which Jews acted against the will of Hashem, the journeys themselves were holy, were, 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 were the journeys themselves were holy and, and very exalted. Give me just one second, I apologize. Give me just one second, I apologize, this is important. Um, so, what the Dal Shem Tov is saying is that even those stories that, that in the Torah seem to be to be um, less than holy and pure, that the people sin there, but in the interpretation of that, of in the application of those journeys to the life of every person, every journey has the potential to be a journey of a pure and, 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 and holy journey. And even those during which Jews acted against the will of Hashem, the journeys themselves were holy and were exalted. For instance, Kivrot Tava, where all their cravings disappeared because of their attachment to Hashem, they had no actual uh, craving. Wherever they bury those with cravings, even the possibility of a craving ceased to exist. On this basis, the previous question becomes stronger. Why does scripture say these are the journeys? The focus certainly should have been placed on the encampments, which symbolize the different levels of serving of service of Hashem, one higher than the other, to which a Jew needs to reach, going from strength to strength throughout his life. So that is the question, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, it's a beautiful parsha. It lists all 42, 40, 42, um, 42 levels. Um, lists all 42 levels, but if you want to talk about the 42 st stages of the journey, the 42 places where the Jewish people grew, moving them closer, both geographically, but also spiritually to the land of Israel, and, corresp and correspondingly is also within, in, the, in, the soul, in the life of every person, that we too have 42 journeys, that we keep going um, higher and higher to come closer to Hashem, by the way, when I, it's, got, it's a little off topic. Why 42? So Kabbalah explains that when we count the Omer, it's really 49. We have seven times seven. Seven spherot times seven, you get to 49. So the question is, why here are there 42? So basically, you're not counting Malchut. You're not counting the lowest one. The reason is because we are in the level of Malchut, and then we have to go upward. As opposed to um, when we count the Omer, we want to bring down from the light of Hashem so then we want to bring down all seven levels. But that's a little bit more technical. The bottom line, all I'm trying to say is that the 42 correspond to the emotional state of the human being, seven times seven minus, minus one of those seven. So you get to 42. Okay, fine. So that's our question. Again, the first question is, why do we focus on the journey, not on the encampment? Number two, encampments, because especially in light of the teaching of the Baal Shem, because the encampments are what's listed. What's listed is the places you rested. So list those places. So call it encampments. That's question number one question. And, and to height, heighten the question is, especially in light of the fact that we say that these 42 places are not just random places, but they represent 42 levels in coming closer to God. Why don't we list those achievements and those accomplishments? And the answer is going to be very simple. The, the answer is going to be that the difference between a human being and an angel is that an angel is perfect, but a human being is on a journey. He's on a march. He's walking. In the prop, there's a prophecy where God tells the prophet, 
you're, you're going to become a mehalech. You're going to walk amongst those who stand still. Angels stand still. They're perfect beings. However they were created, they, they have no challenges. They stay the same. The task of humanity is to constantly grow. And that's emphasized with the idea of journeys. If a person is in a state, and I say, I reached this much, and therefore I'm comfortable, and therefore I'm happy, you missed the point. Uh, well, happy and happy is good, but being satisfied is not good. And therefore, if I reach the point and I say, I'm very comfortable, in, I'm comfortable in my spiritual state, and I don't have to grow more enlightened, more kind, more empathetic, then I'm basically, as we say many times, I'm basically still in Egypt, because Egypt means limitation. And you may have a small prison cell, you may have a beautiful, luxurious prison cell, but the bottom line is if I'm trapped in a space, it's a prison. And therefore, going back to the opening verse, these are the journeys of the Jewish people who left Egypt. If you want to leave Egypt, you constantly have to grow. You can't say, I achieved so much, now I'm going to go into spiritual retirement. I mean, retirement is okay, but spiritual retirement, retirement from spiritual growth is not okay, just like retirement from life itself is not good. Okay, so let's read it inside, and we'll see how, we'll see how far we go. Number four, the explanation is as follows. Ideally, a person's life should be in a state of con consistent journeying. A person should be marching ahead. In the teachings of Hasidus, there is a distinction between standing and marching in relating to, in relating to serving Hashem. Standing implies remaining in the same place. Even if one reaches a higher level, the progress made is relative, as the higher level is comparable to and therefore is connected with and resembles his previous level. So in essence, the individual never truly left the previous level. Truly marching signifies an incomparable progression and elevation where a person completely leaves, leaves his lower level. The higher level is incomparably higher than the previous one. And then he brings a few examples of change that is not that is that is exponential as opposed to gradual therefore scripture states these are the journeys to hint at the at, to hint and to emphasize that a jew when rising from level to level should not remain steadfast and camped in the same type of ascent rather every elevation should be such that each journey is distinct and immeasurably higher than the previous one progressing from strength to strength and in the next chapter, we're going to elaborate upon this and talk about that journey actually has two parts. Part of journeying is the idea of leaving the previous states and disassociating from the previous states. And in some sense, what we're going to say is that true growth can happen when I'm not bound by the old, by, by, by the old perspective, right? There is a, we have our own set of way of looking at the world. And everything we learn new, often we, what we do is we just assimilate into what we already know, but we're not open to completely new ways of thinking. And that's why there's a famous Talmudic story where there was a sage, Rabbi Zaira, we mention him all the time. Rabbi Zaira was living in Babylonia and studying in Babylonia. And Babylonia had a very distinct uh, style of learning Talmud, of learning, analyzing Jewish law. And it was very analytical. And it was and once you moved to, in Israel, the style of learning was completely different. Not that many questions, not many, not not that many discussions. It was there was they tried to get to the point much quicker, as opposed to just, you know, branching out to many areas of discussion and application. Long story short, when Rabbi Zera decided he wants to move from Babylonia and go to Israel, he actually, and he was a great scholar, he actually fasted and prayed to God. The Talmud says he fasted 40 times or 100 times, it's not clear, but he prayed to God. He says, please let me forget everything I know. And you say, it's crazy. Why is that? If you know some information, you get new information. The old information is sort of a, a, sort of pre, pre, a preamble to the later information. Why erase what I know? And the answer is that if you want to, if you want to look at a problem in a completely different way, then you have to be totally open like a child, the way a child studies. And that's why, in some sense, you have to actually leave your previous perspective. Now, I don't mean you have to pray to God and say, forget everything I know. But I'm saying when you're coming to study, when you're coming to grow, one is like, can I become a little better than yesterday? That's one way of doing things. Another way of doing things, can I, can I, can I leave my previous, my, my previous perspective and start anew? And that's what we mean when we say journey. Because journey implies to take myself a step away 
from the old and open myself up to the new. Of course, it's a very difficult thing to do spiritually and emotionally, but sometimes that's the key to, 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 to growth. Okay, a little bit deeper, a deeper, a deeper dimension of this idea. Progression from strength to strength, a quantum elevation involves two steps, leaving the previous level and reaching the higher one. This distinction is reflected in terms marching and journeying. Marching primarily emphasizes going forward, reaching higher, whereas journeying emphasizes not only the act of moving further, but also the departure from a place. They journeyed from, that's what the Torah says. The Torah lists every place. They journeyed from A, went to B. They journeyed from B and went to C. It lists it 42 times. They journeyed from. Journey from means I'm departing my previous state. This is evident in phrases such as let us journey and let us go. They have journeyed on from this place. Let us go to Dotan. And Moshe caused Israel to journey from Yamsuf. We're just bringing different examples in scripture where the word journey means completely separate sever your connection to the previous space. Therefore, we find in several verses that the term journey is used in the sense of uprooting, leaving. Similarly, in Jerusalem Talmud, in place of the expression diverted his attention, uses the expression of his attention journeyed. Diverting one's attention means that the thoughts and focus, that, that thoughts and focus of a person are uprooted from the previous subject. Then he brings an example from the laws of tefillin, which I think we could skip the bottom line is, I have to think about my tefillin. I could think about, even if I lose my focus, I still could, I st it's still consider. I still don't have to make a new blessing because the previous blessing still continues. If I'm just not thinking about the tefillin, but if I'm thinking about something that's the antithesis of tefillin, so I'm tearing my mind away from the tefillin, then I have to make a new blessing. So that's just a, a halachic angle here. But let's go, let's, let's, get, let's get to the point of going back, tying it back to our question. And now we're going to get to, to the, that's why we use the term journey. And that's also why, the, why the, to, the Torah, one more subtlety that we alluded to earlier, but did not elaborate upon, is that it says, these are the journeys of the Jewish people which left the land of Israel. Now, the problem is, the implication is that there were 42 journeys of leaving Egypt. I'm sorry. These are the journeys of the Jewish people who left Egypt. The problem is that the implication of that, that can be read certainly in the Hebrew as there were 42 journeys to leave Egypt. Reality is there's only one journey to leave Egypt. So it should have just said 42 journeys to get to Israel. That, that would be accurate. But you say, these are the 42 journeys of leaving Egypt. No, there's only one journey of, of leaving Egypt. So that's what we mentioned earlier. And that's what we say, can constantly say that in the Hasidic life, from the Hasidic perspective, leaving Egypt is not geographical space, leaving Egypt, the, geog the geographical land and going, going to freedom. But Egypt, the etymology of the word he Egypt in Hebrew, Mitzrayim, is made Sarah's limitation. Leaving Egypt is leaving, leaving limitation. And if at any point in the journey I, I, I stagnate, then I'm still in Egypt. So in other words, every step of growth is really a step of leaving Egypt. Not Egypt in the most severe sense, but Egypt, we can call it even a holy Egypt, holy limitation. That would still be considered Egypt. Now tying it all back together. That's why we have 42 journeys. And that's why we emphasize journey to remind us that the purpose of this achieving a certain plateau is not, it's not a plateau. It's, it's, it's you don't stop here, but you continuously have to keep growing. And that's how we're always on the march out of Egypt. Go ahead, Shoshana, please. Um, this may be too far off base, but um, I heard a shiur about, um, they were talking about the Malacha about uh, breaking down the Mishkan and building it up and that it related to nowadays with um, if you were destroying an area to then like build a Beit Knesset that could actually be done because of the intent but I don't remember exactly yeah, so so in other words in the halacha you're not allowed to destroy uh, a temple you're not allowed to destroy a, a synagogue however if you could say that I'm not destroying this, I'm destroying this so I can build a better structure, then the act of demolition is not classified as an act of demolition. It's classified as an act of building. Yeah. 
pre 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 prerequisites to to building is the demolition of the previous. And, but then the demolition is not a demolition. The demolition is part of the growth. And that's why it's technically, it's not a violation of the prohibition to build, to destroy a temple or to destroy the synagogue because it's actually classified as an act of building because the intent is to build. So similarly, the intent, I'm camping here, but what's my intent? If my intent is to remain here, then I'm in a state of encampment. If I'm in a state of encampment, then I'm in a state of Egypt. It's a much better Egypt than the geographical Egypt and slavery in Egypt. But if I'm trapped in my own limitation, and no matter how beautiful that limitation is, no matter how good of a person I am, the question is, is essentially, am I trapped or not? Am I limited or not? Do I try new things? Do I try to grow? Do I try to explore? Do I try to push myself beyond my comfort zone? That's the question. It doesn't really matter what my comfort zone is. It doesn't matter if I can do one push up, if I can do 20. The question is, am I pushing myself beyond that? And essentially, that's what we're saying. We're saying every, every step, every achievement has to be viewed as part of a journey. That's not, the, that's not the conclusion. If that's the conclusion, I'm still in Egypt. Thank you. Go ahead, Vicky, please. Oh, thank you, Rabbi. And also thank you for yesterday's Kabbalah of time. And that, that class today made me uh, think that it, that idea is tied to the, um, to the idea that we spoke about yesterday, uh, that you can reframe the past. Uh, but you cannot change it physically. However, however, if by reframing the past, you can also learn how to reframe your present because your present consists of those multiple journeys. And in a way, that's, that's the model for our life. We have to rethink every single uh, event or every single step to think how that's going to bring you to the future and how you can rethink your journey as a whole. Yeah, that's very powerful. And it's definitely related to what we're talking about reframing. And therefore, it's actually, the Rebbe elaborates upon it in section number seven. We're at section number six, and we're going to read six, and then we're going to go to seven. So hold the thought, and it's going to tie right in. And in number eight, if we have time for number eight, we'll say it's also related to the period of the year that we're commemorating the destruction of the temple. And the question is, what does that mean to us? Is it destruction? Is it a stage in the rebuilding? So uh, all this is, has to be dealt with, God willing, in the next few minutes. So here we go, going to number six. This is also the explanation behind the verse. This is also, I, do, I mentioned this by, uh, um, by heart. These are the journeys of the children of Israel who went out of the land of Egypt. So this, this, the, the, ver, the use of the plural form, journeys, raises a question for the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad. He asks the question as follows. If the Jews already had left Egypt during the first journey from Ramses to Sukkot, the first journey that they left from Egypt to outside of Egypt, why is the plural from a, a form used journeys to describe them when they left Egypt? The answer, the, he answers that Mitzrayim, Egypt, is etym 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 etymologically related to the word Meitzar, meaning borders and limitations, until the Jews re reached the level of represented by Yarden Yerecha, Jordan River opposite Jericho. They will, in other words, all the steps of the journey till the end of life they were still considered as being restricted by the confines and limitations of Egypt. Consequently, they had not yet severed all their associations with Egypt. Yet, with every subsequent journey, they there was an exodus from Egypt, signifying their exodus from the borders and limitations imposed by the previous encampments. This is the meaning of the verse. Now we're going to tie it all together. This is the meaning of the verse. These are the journeys of the children of Israel who went out of the land of Egypt. The encampments representing the level reached in their service of Hashem did not mark the culmination of the Egyptian exodus. It is necessary to depart from the borders and limitations imposed by every encampment and not remain even within the border and limits of a holy encampment. One mustn't halt at any level as the purpose of the encampments was primarily to resume their journeys, the journeys of the children of Israel who went out from the land of Egypt. In other words, when you camp, uh, is the question, am I camping, am I stopping? Or am I stopping so I can gather the strength to continuing my journey? My journey. And if it's the latter, then even when you camp, you're really journeying. Now let's get back to Vicky's point. Let's not forget. Let's not forget. So that's all beautiful, right? Why is this all beautiful? Because the Baal Shem Tov told us that when we read the 42 journeys, those 42 journeys that everybody experiences in their life could all be positive and holy. The problem is when you open the Bible, you see that many of the journeys were places where the people uh, succumbed. In other words, had spiritual challenges and sinned and went against God's will and severed their relationship with God or tried to sever. 
So how could that be classified as a journey? And here becomes the real radical point. We alluded to it yesterday, but here's a radical point. The radical point is that even the sin, even the separation, even the pain is part of the journey of growth. Because when, if you learn from that experience, and like Ricky says, if you reframe that experience and you allow that experience to become fuel to lead you to become a better person, then even the descent is part of the ascent, right? They have the, 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 the classic Hasidic metaphor is if I'm at a table and I have to jump over the table, what do I have to do? I have to first take a few steps back, then run and then jump over to build the momentum. I have to go back. So going back on the surface, going back means I'm, I'm, I'm retreating. But the reality is that going back is actually a step of going forward. And that's what we're saying. The pain of the, of the sin, the pain of the separation, the pain of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the separating myself from people I love, that pain, you could look at it and say, okay, it's just pain. Or you could look at it and say, that's a journey that's going to propel me forward. And that's, and that's the big idea here. Even the, the, even, the, even the, what's the word? The obstacle, what's the word? Even the, even the stumbling is part of the journey. And that's, that's the big idea here. So let's read seven and then we'll read eight and then we'll see if we have, see what we can do with this. Okay. Another facet regarding the journey. As known, the 42 journeys through the desert symbolizes our exile. Oh, so we're talking about not just in the personal life, but in general, um, if we're in the desert, we're in exile, a time of challenges, a time of difficulty. When Jews find themselves in the desert of nations, from the fact that the Jew, in other words, it's a spiritual desert. From the fact that the Jews are confined in the desert of nations, it emerges that the encampments in the desert include an element of descent and exile, right? So if you're saying we're camping in the, in the desert, means we're settled in a situation of exile. Certainly, the encampments in the places where they angered me, right? Rashi, 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 um, Rashi, um, Rashi says, talks about a metaphor in the beginning of the parsha, which we spoke about last year. Maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow, that there are certain places, a metaphor where the, where the father takes the son. And then on the way back, he tells the son, uh, these are all the places where you angered me. And that's why he lists the places. And Rashi says, God's listing the Torah, listing the places where God ang where we angered God. Because some of those journeys were, placed where we were places where we angered God. So the point is, so certainly those places where we angered God represent the descent. These encampments, nonetheless, are still referred to as journeys implying ascension. This is a very Hasidic idea. Even the fall, even the descent is part of the growth. The explanation is as follows. The ultimate purpose of descending into exile is the subsequent redemption. Every slide prepares for a subsequent climb. Only by descending can a person achieve an ascent, surpassing his level prior to the descent. Just as light shines brighter when emerging from darkness. Accordingly, it is understood that the descent into exile is an integral part of the overall ascent toward reaching Yard and Yerecha, which is Jericho, the level of Reach, Reach, smell, which symbolizes the revelation of Mashiach, who will judge to smell, also confirming his identity without getting into the, the power. The mystical idea here, but, uh, but smell represents a very deep spiritual level. Um, that's why with even the body, the Talmud says that the greatest, that the soul receives the most pleasure from the sense of smell. Food is a little, a, little too, a little too physical for the soul, but smell is what gives the soul pleasure, the aroma. Without getting into that right now, what we're trying to say is, is that the scent is what will lead you to the, to, to the ascent. Even when a Jew, God forbid, succumbs to something contrary to Hashem's will, he should not despair. Rather, he should strive to extract greater light from the darkness, from the misstep. He should exemplify the dynamic of journeying upwards, which is, superior, which is the superior quality of repentance. Therefore, the Torah already refers to the shortcoming as journeys, because inwardly, although concealed, it marks the beginning of the ascent. This is so radical. What we're saying here is a sin, a place where I sinned, a place where I succumbed, a place where I did something negative, where, where I did something destructive. What we're saying is, that is classified as journey because if I handle this correctly, then that experience will be part of the growth. Unbelievable. And now we're going to tie it to the period of the year we read this, which is the week, the three weeks between 17th of Tammuz, where we where we mourn and we we commemorate the days when the, the walls of Jerusalem were, were breached. And then ninth of Av, the destruction of the temple and the subsequent exile. So we have to think about exile in the same terms. You could look at it as a time of destruction, or you could look at it as a time of renovation, 
right? That's a very powerful idea because that's 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 the idea of, of Shoshana mentioned that is demolition, is it destruction or is it rebuilding? So you're walking down the street and you see the tractors destroying a home. On the surface, you say, what, how destructive? These people are so destructive. But if you understand the context, you realize that this is actually not a con in the context of destruction. It's actually in the context of rebuilding. And this period of the year as well, we think about the destruction, but we understand that destruction is really a construction site. And a construction site is not always pleasant. I'd much rather have the construction concluded. So it's not always pleasant, but it's always critical for the subsequent growth. Okay, on this basis, it is understood that the connection between Parshas Masse, the portion of Masse, and the time that this Parsha is publicly read, Bein HaMitzarim, between the straits, that's the name of the Parsha, between the, the, the three weeks, between the, the, the two difficult days, the 17th of Tammuz and the 9th of Av, Chodesh Av, serves to encourage Jewish people. As we enter the days of Bein HaMitzarim, between the straits, the days of mourning, um, particularly the nine days, which begin Rosh Chodesh Menachem Av, the last nine days of these three weeks is the, where the mourning is intensified, reminding us that the great descent of the last exile, the bitterness of the exile, should not make a Jew lose hope. Rather, he should recognize that all this is intended for him to transfigure and transform. Itapcha will cause that I, Hashem, will transform into journeys and elevations. When I, in my life, are able to transform a descent into an ascent, then God does that in the rest of the world that has global ramifications and implications. Therefore, especially during these days, a person should strive to, to increase vitality, passion, and luminance with more enthusiasm and more light. There is no light, more, no light except for Torah, meaning increase positivity and growth and journeying in these days. This will bring the light of the Bein HaMitzarim. This will bring the light to the Bein HaMitzarim, to the period of mourning, and will reveal the ascending journeys embedded within, within it until the main journey when these days will be transformed to joy, to gladness, to happy festivals, especially speedily in our days, literally in verse in, in footnote 40, a verse from Zechariah, where God says, not only will the days of mourning and days of fasting um, be, 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 be uh, nullified, and then we get to, to neutral days, but the days of fasting will be actually be transformed to days of joy. How so? Let's say I had a tragedy. And the ninth of Av is a tragedy. And then the temple is rebuilt. Okay, so now it's just a regular day. But why, why would it be a joyous day? The answer is it's a joyous day because the tragedy is transformed to good, to positivity, because I realize how I grew from that experience. And therefore, the energy of the day changes. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. We look how you look at my own life. There's no such thing as any part of life that is outside the scope of the journey upward. And even what looks like a descent and looks like a, 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 a critical and important setback, it's only a setback in my own perspective. But I can change the perspective and realize that that setback could actually propel me further, closer to God, because the distance creates the longing, which creates the passion, which creates the fuel for further growth, just like the stepping back creates the momentum to be able to leap forward. So this is powerful stuff. Um, you read it from the Rebbe himself in the translation. So I didn't all I, I just, I, I would just elect it to read it out loud, but the inspiration is right there for everyone to see and appreciate. And hopefully we can internalize this message and keep growing in our journey. So thank you for joining and hope to see you in good health.